Hello, one and all, and welcome to the Web EV Talks series. Uh, this is Jan Lefal, and this is the podcast. So it's my pleasure to re-welcome uh, Ken Whitford to to the podcast to further discuss the similarities and differences between exosomes, uh, exocellular vesicles, and the COVID-19 virus, SARS-CoV-2. Welcome, Ken. Thank you, Jan. I'm very excited to be back and looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, it was good fun, uh, the previous discussion we had. It was quite extensive, uh, but we still have a lot of questions and, and issues that were brought up on the uh, on the comments um, section of the YouTube channel. So we won't be able to answer all of them, but I'm sure we can discuss a few of them uh, during this conversation. Let's do it. Let's do it. So, um, so you've been working with viruses for a long time, and and what we've seen over many years with new viruses, including, for example, HIV, was that there were a lot of conspiracy theories and people that were arguing that this is not a virus and so on. So, could you just tell us where you come from on that, from that perspective? Sure. Yeah, I'd be glad to. So I've been working with um, retroviruses, which are a kind of enveloped virus for my um, really essentially my entire career. Um, so I, I started to study retroviruses when I was a PhD student. Um, and I quickly learned that there was a, a, a vocal but very, very small minority who did not believe that HIV existed. Or in some cases, they believed that the virus might exist, but that it was completely harmless. Um, now, why somebody would believe this uh, in the face of uh, overwhelming scientific evidence, um, it's, it's unclear. And I think we can talk about the reasons for why, uh, why conspiracy theories arise, uh, maybe mm -hmm. later in this call or some other time. But that that we're not experts in, are we? We're not uh, no, sociology no, no. professors, we're biologists, really, so that's where we have to... <laughs> you look at the evidence. You know, you and I have been... Yes. Doing, um, we have been trained to look at the evidence and to evaluate the evidence. Mm -hmm. and so that's what we are. That's what we are best at. And um, you know, I, I think it was very perplexing for me to see these um, see these opinions. Right? They were they were opinions that were not based in fact at all. Uh, they did not um, show that you know their adherents understood the facts. Um, and 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 so it was exactly the opposite of what I was I was used to and what I was trained to do as a scientist. It was basically taking um, taking a, a, a reality and turning it into a fiction. Um, so that's something that we always do our very best to avoid um, in the world of science. Um, but these, um, you know, I think that these, uh, these theories, these conspiracy theories around HIV um, were, were also quite interesting to me because it made me think about how strong our evidence actually was. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and in some cases, the questions were so uh, seemingly bizarre that I hadn't even thought about some of these issues before. Um, but it turned out that in every single case, um, the answers were there, um, mm -hmm. the answers were very strong, the evidence behind those answers was very strong, um, and so these, um, in, indeed, these conspiracy theories were not rooted uh, in, in reality um, for, for HIV and for the, the way that HIV causes disease. So, in you thinking then about the Cox postulates uh, as a definition of a of an agent causing a disease, is that is that your that's what you're talking well, about now? So th that was one of the um, you know that was one of the points that the uh, the HIV AIDS denialists would always uh, would always bring up the Cox postulates. So uh, Robert Koch, he was a, a a German scientist. He came up with these postulates around 1890. Mm -hmm. um, and he came. He he uh, he made these postulates or these um, you know these kind of guidelines for understanding infectious disease uh, because of diseases that were caused by bacteria. So how do I prove to you that a particular disease is caused by a bacterium? Um, and so uh, you know there there are various versions of his postulates. Of course, they've been translated into different languages, and different people have taken them and have tried to apply them to other infectious agents. Um, but but basically, what these postulates come down to is that you have to show, uh, in the cases of the disease, uh, that the infectious agent is present. Mm -hmm. 
So, so that's a, that's a very important part of the postulates. You, and you have to be able to to isolate this thing, somehow separate it out from all the background of whatever. You know, you take a name, noise, swab, yeah. You take the blood. You take you you take away all the th the other things that are there, and you're left with this bacterium. In his case, mm -hmm. um, and then. You have to be able to show that there is a, that there is disease when you re-inoculate another host with that with that agent, um, and then and then you know maybe you also isolate again from that from that infected uh, individual. <clears throat> so now these are uh, I think these are these are uh, ways to generate very strong evidence that an infectious agent ca causes disease. Um, however, uh, Koch himself. Uh, during his lifetime, realized that there are going to be exceptions to this. Um, mm -hmm. so he he was he was interested in, in numerous infectious diseases, but in, um, in 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 one of the cases, he found that um, there were actually people who could have a bacterium, be infected with the bacterium, but not have symptoms of the disease. And we uh, recognize that today, don't we? That's, uh, that happens with a lot of uh, infectious diseases. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, so, so he realized that uh, you know for that for that first that first postulate where you you need to be able to um, identify the infectious agent in the person with the disease um, that that doesn't necessarily mean that every single case of where you you isolate or identify the pathogen has to be coming from a diseased patient. If I, I'm not sure if I said that quite coherently, but right. you, yeah. you have a population, you, you may have a population of individuals with the pathogen, but who are not sick. Uh, and so this is where, you know, when people were talking about HIV and the Koch's postulates, they said, well, wait a minute, somebody might have this infection for many, many years before they get sick. And mm -hmm. that means that Koch's postulates are not fulfilled. Um, because in in their minds, uh, if the person doesn't get sick right away, then the pathogen is not really a pathogen. It's just something harmless. Um, and we have a lot of viruses, and we have a lot of bacteria. Well, you know, we have bacteria that live in our bodies, <clears throat> especially in our in our gut. You know, all through the the um, digestive tract, um, that are that that live in perfect harmony with us uh, most times. Uh, so, so but if they get into the wrong space, they can mess up our lives severely. And that is, that's another thing I think that the, the community has realized since uh, Koch developed these postulates, that sometimes it's about the location of the pathogen. So it's not mm -hmm. even a pathogen until it gets into the wrong place. Uh, so, so, and, uh, you know, he, uh, Koch was working with bacteria. He was thinking about bacteria. Um, what about viruses? Uh, you know, so as as um, as virus as we we came to know more and more about viruses, Koch's postulates were revised um, to uh, to account for the the virus. Now, the the bacterium, many bacteria can actually live on their own. So you could take a bacterium from a person who's infected, put it into a culture, and grow it. It might replicate. Um, some bacteria you can't do that with, right? So if we say if we say to fulfill whoever's postulates, we have to be able to grow the bacterium. Um, well, there's a lot of bacteria out there that we simply cannot grow um, in culture. That is to say, outside the body of the host. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and 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 the um, and that does not mean that those bacteria are not uh, infectious or that they don't cause disease. Um, the same thing with viruses. You know, we we might be able to. Um, we might have a hard time finding the right conditions to grow um, to grow a virus um, in, in in the lab. Um, again, that doesn't mean that it doesn't cause um, disease. So, so yeah, the the Koch's postulates very very important, um, very uh, very good uh, ways to get evidence about infection. Uh, but we need to keep in mind that they're also 130 years old. Uh, you know, we. Um, we didn't have the automobile then. We didn't have the personal computer. We didn't have um, we didn't have rockets or any any you know. There's been so much development, um, including in our understanding of infectious diseases um, since then, that today um, it is not necessary to establish um, these these postulates, um, especially when we know that it it can be difficult. Um, however, I do want to point out 
that uh, Koch's postulates, um, I believe, have been fulfilled. Uh, they were fulfilled for SARS, so the original uh, coronavirus. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, sorry, the the the, um, the 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 first SARS SARS virus. Two thousand three. Yeah. Two thousand three. Koch's postulates were fulfilled, um, and I believe that they have been fulfilled now for SARS CoV two as well, despite the fact that we've known about this thing for only a few months. So when somebody mm -hmm. tells you that um, you know, that we need to prove Koch's postulates. Um, for this virus, I think they're showing you that they don't really know, um, they don't really know the literature, and they probably don't know Koch's postulates either. Exactly, and I, I just put up the uh, the electron microscopy pictures of uh, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus and uh, an exosome, vesicle exosome, and, and they are very different from a morphological perspective. So, um, even though they have some similar similarities that we discussed last time we spoke, uh, and and the coronavirus manufacturing is partly hijacking the exosome manufacturing process in the cell. It's still a fundamentally different uh, beast. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right, Jan. Um, and 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 this is a this is a perplexing thing that has come up on the internet recently, um, where you have uh, you know these kind of self-appointed experts telling telling uh, telling people that. The coronavirus is not real. Uh, it's um, th that is to say, it's not really a virus. It is not infectious. It is not a disease-causing agent. Rather, it is part of the host. Uh, it's part of the individual who is said to be infected. And specifically, it's a, it's an exosome or extracellular vesicle. So, um, so, so first of all, you know, I think I, I would just want to draw a distinction here. Um, in that, uh, so, some folks who are coming to these um, these uh, uh, um, topics don't really know what an extracellular vesicle or an exosome is. This is really just exactly. a piece of the cell. Um, so it's a piece of the cell that has that has pinched off or been right pushed here. out, and that that's the one over there on the right. So you can see that there is a um, a lipid bilayer. That's the that's kind of the dark part that surrounds it. Right here, um, and, and that is, you know, that's coming from the membrane of the cell. So this is, it's almost like a, you know, a bubble. You can blow a, a, a bubble, um, a soap bubble, for example, and you might be able to cut it in two with your finger. Um, and it's something similar that happens with the lipids of the cell, where you can get this little packet that, that pinches off. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, and and actually, there's there are different places in and on the cell where these extracellular vesicles can be produced. So we call it a vesicle because it's lipid bound, it's extracellular because it's left the cell. And so the EV or extracellular vesicle can come from the surface of the cell, but it can also come from internal compartments. Mm -hmm. When it comes from the internal compartments, we call that an exosome. Um, and the exosome is then a specific kind of <laughs> extracellular vesicle. Now, when people are showing us these comparisons between the coronavirus and the exosome, um, you know, unf unfortunately, they 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 don't seem to understand. Maybe they don't. Um, they they don't know that uh, it's actually difficult to show that something is an exosome after it has left the cell, and so they they don't they don't do that. So that's that's one thing that I think is um, is is a problem here. But the other the other thing that is a problem, a very big problem, with this line of argumentation, saying, well, this thing looks like that thing, therefore they're the same, um, is that that's a it's it's not logical. Um, there are there are all sorts of, uh, of 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 particles that can look like each other. You know, we could um, we could put up a, a lipid particle here, maybe we, like um, you know in our cholesterol, protein. yeah, Any high cholesterol. density lipoprotein, yeah, exactly. So we could um, we can maybe have a, a a high density or low density or chylomicron. You know, these things can also look almost like viruses, depending on how the image is is is, is made. Um, and and they are very abundant too. So does this mean that the coronavirus is just a bunch of cholesterol? No, you know th th these are these are uh, you know just logically um, logically uh, uh, nonsensical. So um, now, what does any of this mean then for diagnosis? Because what our um, what our friends are telling us uh, when they say that the coronavirus is an exosome. Is that the um, you know in the diagnostic uh, sphere um, we are mistaking uh, a host exosome for an infectious virus? Uh, is there anything? Is there any? Um, uh, is there is is this? A, sorry, <clears throat> excuse me. So is is there anything that is um, um, that that makes sense about this idea? 
uh, actually there is not. So we do not diagnose viruses by looking at them with an electron microscope. Um, so it doesn't matter how closely the virus resembles an exosome, we're not going to mistake the virus for an exosome in the laboratory. Um, what's, another, what's another argument that is sometimes used? Well, people say the coronavirus contains RNA and the exosome contains RNA. Therefore, when we look for RNA of the virus, we're actually detecting RNA of the host exosome. Um, this is also complete nonsense. Um, complete course, we're nonsense. Not, we're not just looking for RNA. Yeah. We are looking for specific sequences of RNA. Right. And so the RNA, um, of course, the RNA in the cell is coming from DNA in the nucleus. Um, mm -hmm. And if, you, if we think of the RNA, of all the RNA that's in the cell and all the RNA that can get packaged into an extracellular vesicle or into a virus, uh, we, we should really think about this RNA almost like, like the letters in a book. Um, mm -hmm. And if you, if you take a, a one page out of that book um, and compare it with any other page, you're going to find that those pages are quite different. Um, so if we take any given exosome or EV or any given virus, we're going to find that there are very specific sequences, very specific pages from that book um, that are contained in those particles. Uh, and as a result, you know, we are not going to mistake uh, one of these kinds of particles for another. And, and why is that? Well, in the case of the coronavirus, it has a 30 kilobase genome. Uh, what does that mean? 30 kilobases is 30,000 bases, or if we use the letter analogy, that's 30,000 letters. When we look for, when we try to, uh, to, to diagnose a virus, um, we're going to use a technique that will amplify a very small segment of that 30,000 um, 30, letter genome. Um, so we are going to be, look, we are, and we are going to design those assays so that we will not amplify something else. We will not amplify the host um, RNA that could be found in an exosome. Um, so there are, there are thousands of, actually tens of thousands of combinations um, of the reagents, the sequences that we use to amplify that, vir that viral RNA. Um, and there's, there are many, many of these tests available th uh, throughout the world now for the, the new coronavirus. Uh, so basically, I mean, we know that uh, all of these uh, letters are in here, and I guess the, from a letter perspective, the same letters are there, but these sentences are totally, totally different compared to the sentences here, and these are non-self sentences to 100%. That's right, that's right. We do, the coronavirus is not found in our genome. Um, we do not find coronavirus sequences in uninfected cells. Um, and and that, that means that we can be very confident in the results of the clinical tests that use uh, PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, to amplify these viral sequences. Um, I've heard people, you know, say, well, what if the test actually doesn't work? What if, the, what if you made a mistake and the test is actually detecting those sentences from the host and not from a virus? Um, and it could do this because you are, you know, let's say, isolating exosomes from your, uh, from, you know, from your patient samples. Well, if that had happened um, at any time during this, uh, this pandemic, uh, scientists would have figured it out almost immediately uh, because there is not just one test that's available. There are many, many tests, and many labs have even developed their own tests. This is something that you and I do regularly. We can go into the lab today. Uh, actually, we can just design assays from our computer, order the reagents, and start testing things tomorrow. Um, so if there's a faulty assay out there, somebody's going to figure out that it's wrong and they're going to correct it. Uh, that's how science works. Um, we, are not all, we don't always do things right the first time. Uh, we, it might take us 10 times to do things right. But we get it, we get it right because we follow a, a, a process. We follow a I process mean, the, of correction. Exactly. And I said it last uh, vlog as well, but the energy by which the scientific community has come together and really pinned down to understand the details of this virus quickly is just stunning. I think there are more than 1,500 published papers out there already. And the first time we had a paper on the virus was, I think, 23rd of January or something like that. Uh, late January, anyway. And, um, you know, self-correction is a very important feature there. Yes, and it is, 
it is indeed great to see how so many scientists have come together um, to confront this scourge that we're facing um, and, and to see the productivity that has come out of that because that, that makes a difference for the patients and that makes a difference for how we are going to continue to handle this pandemic. Um, and it also, it, it also makes a difference for what's going to happen in the future. So um, it's only a matter of time before the next coronavirus or the next flu virus or, or, or whatever the, the virus might be um, emerges. And what we learn now is going, to, is going to continue to help us in the future. So, you know, we, we were talking a little bit about Koch's postulates, and, I, um, uh, and, now, and now we've talked about the specific sequence of the virus. Um, the, it's RNA genome. So I, I want to make um, an, another comment um, about Koch's postulates and about how they have, or how our understanding um, of proof has evolved over time. Um, so many um, of our colleagues would say that uh, in the case of coronavirus, we knew that this thing was causing uh, COVID-19 um, almost from the very start because we knew the sequence. Um, and so we didn't even have to go into the lab and culture the virus, put it into a new host, see if it causes disease and so on, uh, because of what we already knew from history. Um, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned that Koch's postulates were fulfilled for SARS back in 2003, um, and that right. is indeed the case. So since we have that virus, we know that virus, we know its sequence, we know its structure, we know exactly what it does, um, and now we have a new one that is obviously very much related to it. We can yeah. make the conclusion just from the RNA sequence um, that these things are related and they are likely to be causing similar um, diseases, which indeed it turns out that that's the case. Um, so, so our knowledge today of RNA, of, um, of, of how RNA is turned into proteins, of how RNA is packaged into the virus and so on, these are things that, that Robert Koch knew nothing about in 1890. Um, and in fact, we didn't, uh, you know, we've, we've only really uh, developed this knowledge fully in the last half century. Um, so we have, to, we have to keep that in mind as well, that we, we really know a lot about this virus um, and about how it works. Uh, yeah, so basically those were the early days of understanding infection and, and that was a very important postulate or, or a rule to prove something scientifically and, and we're still applying that rule for many mechanistic studies as well or the principles of that that you can mimic an effect and, and, and so on. So I think that was exceptionally uh, uh, important. So, I mean, some of the questions we had is could, could the um, viral RNA actually end up in an exosome? And would that exosome then be infectious? Yeah, so that's, that's actually quite an interesting question. Um, and it's a, it's a question that I don't think we can answer yet for SARS-CoV-2. Um, we do know for some other viruses, uh, so the virus, of course, is um, its genome is in the cell. The cell is replicating the virus, and that means that the cell is making more of the building blocks that the virus needs um, for, its, for its replication. Uh, so this, uh, in the case of an RNA virus, of course, this would be RNA. There might be genomic RNA. There might be, um, which is the full-length RNA of the virus that's needed for replication. But then you might also have fragments, um, just break down fragments of that RNA mm -hmm. that, are, that are in the cell. Uh, and the same thing with protein. So the virus is hijacking the protein-making machinery, the translational machinery in the cell. And uh, that means that there's a lot of viral proteins that are floating around. So if a an EV is being made, an extracellular vesicle or an exosome, then it is, um, it, it, there's a chance that it's going to incorporate some of these viral components. Um, and we see that in, in HIV, as an example. We, I might be able to find small fragments of HIV RNA um, mm -hmm. in host uh, EVs. And, uh, and then uh, for some viruses, they, um, they can actually move from cell to cell um, without the infectious virion. They can just do that using, um, using an extracellular vesicle um, if that vesicle is able to package enough of the, of the genome. So, um, so it's a, it's a, it, it varies, though, tremendously from one virus to another, um, and only a few viruses have been shown uh, to be able to replicate that way. 
So what does that mean for our understanding of coronavirus? Uh, could it mean that coronavirus is not infectious or does not cause disease? No, not at all. Um, what, it, what, it, what it means simply is that there are viral components in the infected cell. Um, so if we find viral RNA, whether it's in an infectious virion, whether it's in an infected cell, or whether it's in an exosome from an infected cell, um, doesn't really matter. What we know then is that there is an infection event, um, and we can diagnose, um, diagnose that, that infection. So another thing that I suppose is supporting the concept that the disease is, is, is a virus is that it is evolving. As we see this pandemic uh, spread the world, we are actually seeing slightly different viruses in different parts of the world. Uh, and I think there are thousands of sequences that have been uh, performed uh, and, and reported to different databases that, that describe that. Those differences can be quite small. Usually in this spike protein, there's some, potentially some uh, spike proteins that may have a higher affinity to the AC2 receptor in the recipient cell than other ones do. Whether that's important for infectivity or not is, is a different matter. But it's, it's, uh, it's just showing exactly the features of, of a pandemic viral infection from that perspective as well. Yes, that's right. So the, the evolution of the virus, its sequence evolution, um, is, is also something that we know a lot about. And different viruses are going to, going to uh, display different rates of evolution. Um, so why, why would it be that a virus would evolve um, specifically changes to those, uh, those proteins on the surface? So you're showing here uh, the coronavirus with the spike proteins displayed, um, which, mm -hmm. which of course is one of the ways that we can distinguish the coronavirus from, uh, from a host exosome. Um, but you can see that those spike proteins, are, they are going to be the, the virus's point of contact with the cell that it's going to infect. Um, and they are on the surface, obviously. Uh, yeah, this so, stick, so this is sticking out from the actual virion, you call it, right? It's sticking out. It's sticking out from that membrane, it's, and it's, you can see they're very Big antenna. on the surface. You know, they're, they're, not, um, they're not anything, we don't see anything like that on this exosome that's to the right. Um, so so the, the virus might evolve um, these, uh, the shape, basically, or the, uh, the presentation of these uh, proteins, um, maybe to make itself more or less infectious. Mm. Um, so, so some viruses will actually attenuate themselves over time a little bit so that they're not quite as infectious and not le uh, maybe not as likely to, to kill a host. Um, but maybe more importantly for the virus is escaping the immune system of the host. So as those spike proteins, as the sequences that encode them mutate, um, change slightly, um, so too might the recognition of those proteins by the host immune system. And so this, um, this can be a big problem um, if we're designing a vaccine and then the virus mutates around the vaccine. That is, it's, uh, the vaccine is working against the old version of the virus, but not mm -hmm. the new one. Um, and it can also be a problem in the, in the individual infected host um, where virus clearance uh, virus clearance might, might, might not happen immediately, or the virus might come back and uh, still be able to infect the host despite an immune response. Um, so I, 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 hear, I hear this argument, or I've heard this argument for HIV sometimes. People say, well, if HIV were, in, it were really an infectious virus, we would have developed a vaccine for it a long, long time ago. Therefore, it's not real, or it's, it's not infectious, or whatever. Um, that's a very artificial yeah, argument. Yeah, yeah, and, and I mean, I think that that's something that, that we understand very well, but to, you know, to, to somebody who doesn't yeah. know the virology or the immune system, um, they, can, they can be deceived by, the, by these uh, falsehoods. Mm -hmm. um, what's actually happening there is, um, is exactly this, the mutation. So HIV has a very high mutation rate, um, and it's a, it, it changes those surface displayed molecules um, quite rapidly, and so that's um, that's one of several reasons for why an HIV vaccine has not been successful yet. Um, so, so yes, um, as we go from one virus to another, 
Um, we can have some that are, very, you know, we can vaccinate against quite well and others that we just have not succeeded, um, uh, succeeded with a vaccine yet. So, I mean, when we're talking about vaccines, we have to ask the question whether, whether we think, you think, that we will have a vaccine against the coronavirus in over a decent period of time and, and within a year or something like that. What's your thought about, thoughts about that? Well, I, I certainly hope so. And I, I know that many groups are working on vaccines right now. Some, uh, some mm -hmm. are going into trials already. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I, so this again concerted effort by the scientific community is quite encouraging, um, and um, and and we know that we're doing our very best to um, to to land at that vaccine. Um, um, I can't predict the future, but I am um, I'm I'm optimistic that we will have something um, that's going to that's going to be protective. So I know there are, I know of at least five different groups that are developing extracellular vesicles as vaccines, using these uh, structures or, or similar structures to actually put one of these molecules, just one of them, on the surface to help it create an immune response uh, in, in individuals uh, and, and, thereby, and thereby creating a, a immunity against the, the virus itself. And... Uh, I'm sure you're thinking in those terms as well. We are certainly in my lab as well. Yes, yes. So there are indeed many groups that are trying to use the EV as a platform. Um, and the EV does lend itself well to that uh, because we can select EVs by size. So we can select EVs to be around the size of the, um, of the coronavirus. Uh, we can, um, as you mentioned, display things on the surface of the EV. We can yeah. display multiple multiple things on the surface. Yeah. So we can take uh, just maybe a particular domain of that spike protein, maybe not the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, we could put several of the membrane proteins of the coronavirus onto an EV. And we could also, I think what's also very exciting about EVs is that we can modify them, we can engineer them um, to have different properties, um, such as recognition by immune cells. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's uh, uh, maybe to uh, reduce their clearance from the system mm -hmm. um, too rapidly. So there's there's all sorts of things that we can do with protein engineering um, and with chemical modifications um, to EVs that we that we might not be able to do with some of the other um, uh, platforms that are out there. So yeah, so there are m many different types of, of vaccines. There's an mRNA vaccine from Moderna. I think that was the first one to be tested. There are exosomes that have been developed as vaccines. There are spike proteins with perhaps with an adjuvant that is being used. And which one do you think is going to win the race? Or is there a winner or is there a hundred winners? Well, um, I, I think that ideally we would have multiple options. Um, and I don't, I don't know who's going to win the race, but I think it's, it's, it's a, it's a race that might have multiple winners. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, the, the real winners will be, will be the patients or the, the, the prospective patients, let's call them, um, mm -hmm. who can be protected against this infection. Um, and that's going to be more likely to happen if we have multiple, um, you know, multiple ways to, um, to immunize. There are some reports as well that some individuals um, get well from the infection and then they're testing positive again. Uh, why do you think that happens? Are they still having some virus playing around in their body and they didn't want to leave? And what's going on there? So that is not clear yet. Um, this is a very interesting phenomenon, and it could be, um, it could be indeed that maybe the, the immune response uh, was not strong enough to prevent a reinfection. Or it could be that the virus was hiding somewhere um, in the body for a while, mm -hmm. um, and so we, um, we 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 know of several cases of viruses that are able to infect the individual, then they seem to go away, um, and then they come back, and they um, they might come back with some herpes virus is a classical one. Everybody knows about herpes, right? Yes, yes, that is. Uh, so so this reawakening, this this ability of the virus to get into a cell. And then to kind of shut itself down for for a while until there is some event to reawaken it, um, 
that is um, that is a well-known property of, of of several viruses that you know they've evolved these very intricate mechanisms of making sure that they get replicated when the host cell replicates, mm -hmm. um, but without without actually producing infectious material mm -hmm. um, until the 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 right or from our perspective the wrong um, occasion. I want to strongly reiterate your concern there that this is absolutely not proven. Uh, it's a it's a possibility we, that we have to look into to understand how to manage this disease in the long term future. That's my mindset anyway. Yeah, so so that's um, that that's exactly exactly right. Um, so so we don't know what is behind this phenomenon of the apparent um, reinfection. Uh, we don't know that yet, but we do know from our knowledge of virology that there are numerous cases of viruses that can do that, that um, I should say can, can go latent um, in the host um, and then come back. Um, and so, so it, wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be the first time this has happened and it certainly would not mean that, um, that coronavirus is not infectious or that it's, um, it's, not, it's not pathogenic. So uh, you you looked at the HIV um, conspiracy theories and and rumors that were going on, and we're seeing a lot of similar things going on right now. We started a vlog by discussing that, and even prominent leaders in the world are are claiming some drugs might work, and um, and then in the end of the day, maybe they don't, uh, or or a clinical trial shows they don't, or maybe it does in a very very specific small subgroup. So comment on that yeah so I, I think that uh, politicians would be well advised um, to avoid making claims about specific medications um, unless uh, you know in, unless those claims are backed by by very solid scientific evidence mm -hmm. um, because because this is um, you know this is some, this is something that can affect many many people um, you know, we've we've had a case recently where a medication that was proposed for use against COVID-19 um, is actually needed by people who have another very serious condition, um, and it got depleted because all uh, everyone ran out and bought this medication, um, took took it took all the stock of it down. Chloroquine, yeah. Chloroquine, yes, and uh, and and uh, you know, and, and so so people who needed the medication couldn't get it, and there actually was not very strong evidence that it that it was working. And now we are seeing more evidence coming out um, that indicates that it's uh, it's not it's not really helpful against COVID nineteen, and could even be harmful in some cases. So you know, there's a parallel to this um, back in the late 1990s with HIV. Um, so there was um, unfortunately several leaders of South Africa at that time. Uh, became convinced that HIV was um, was 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 not pathogenic, um, and that AIDS was being caused by something else. And at one point, one of the leaders, or the, the actually the leader of the country, um, endorsed a particular drug um, to be used against um, against AIDS. Um, and there was no evidence for this drug uh, being being effective. Um, so so we you know the, this is this is something that has happened before. Um, and that it would be good to avoid. Um, it would be good to avoid in this pandemic. And hopefully, um, you know, those advisors to the presidents and prime ministers and so on who know the medicine, mm -hmm. know the biology, um, will be able to rein in some of these unfortunate um, uh, statements that, that have been made. Um, so, the public health here. I think thinking about the public health. Um, is is very important, and and the public health, um, the health of of citizens mm -hmm. demands that uh, you know leaders make make good decisions and statements that are rooted in um, in fact. I agree with that very strongly, and I'm a bit concerned what's going on in Sweden right now, as many of my friends know. So um, I I I think it would be very interesting to have a a social sociological discussion about why why uh, these conspiracy theories appear and why they bloom so efficiently in in the world of uh, social networks. I'm not sure we are the right people to speak about that, but if you have a last comment about that, I'd be happy to, to hear what you think. Yeah, you know, Jan, when, um, when I was um, 
when I was learning in the beginning of you know my my studies about these HIV conspiracy theories, I, I pondered that quite a bit, um, and um, and and I, I I came to the conclusion that in some cases um, falling prey to conspiracy theories is 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 natural. Um, it's a mm -hmm. natural response to being faced with something that is uncomfortable. Something that mm -hmm. is harmful, something that something that makes you afraid, um, because yes, there's this virus out there, and we don't know exactly where it came from. We don't know exactly, um, we don't know everything about it yet. Um, and um, as 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 someone who does not know the virology or the, or the other elements of the biology, um, it's it, it seems to be a little bit easier to be able to point a finger at something, or at someone to say this mm -hmm. is something that was created by a government. This is something that is being created by the mainstream media or by right. big pharmaceutical companies or whatever. Um, so so it, it kind of simplifies um, simplifies things if you can point a finger. But you know what with the HIV um, the HIV conspiracy theories, the saddest saddest part of that for me is that I would debate some of these people online. Um, and then I would find out several years later that they had they had actually died. Um, because in, yeah. in some cases, these individuals were infected. Um, mm. They were HIV. Positive. In that case, with HIV, yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, they didn't want to. They 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 were in denial about their own um, about their own health. They didn't want to believe that they were that they were uh, in danger, and so they didn't take their medication, or they didn't they didn't get medication. They would be with us today if they had taken that medication. Um, but sometimes these conspiracy mm -hmm tendencies, conspiratorial tendencies, um, can actually harm individuals and then also the public health. So I hope, I hope that, you know, maybe some people will take that um, very sad lesson to heart um, mm -hmm. and, and realize that, um, you know, there are people who know what they're talking about when it comes to virology. We know that, that SARS-CoV-2 is infectious and that it's a pathogen. Um, and whether you want to believe that or not um, is, of course, up to you. But please don't. But it's it's 100 percent, 100 percent, with 100 percent confidence, right? There's no 100 percent confidence. Yeah. No, no, no doubt. doubt. No doubt at all. And, and you know what we need to what what I hope that people will will will, will try to keep in mind um, is that even if you continue to have doubts um, about whether whether this is infectious or not, whatever. We need to really follow um, the guidelines, the recommendations of our, our public health authorities, mm -hmm. um, and 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 make sure that you know whatever this thing is, we need to fight it. Um, we know that it's a virus. We know how to fight viruses. So let's please come together um, and follow these guidelines and 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 continue our fi our physical distancing, um, continue um, with restrictions as is needed um, to um, to avoid this uh, getting any worse. One last comment here from me, and, and you can respond to that as well, but one way vaccination works or herd immunity that people talk about is that you have less spread in a society. So your R0 or re reproductive rate is below one, and that ends up, you know, basically the virus has nowhere else to go, so it, it doesn't infect anybody else. And that can be achieved by the immunity, by IgG antibodies and, and vaccination and so on. That's one way of getting it. You need approximately for this virus 60, 70 percent probably, uh, if, if I'm, if I'm correctly informed, uh, of immunity to, to reach that level. But couldn't you in principle reach herd immunity by doing what we're doing now? Social distancing or physical distancing and, uh, uh, not touching each other, see to it that we're always clean, maybe wear fa face masks in public places and so on. Is that also in a way, not herd immunity, but herd uh, uh, inhibition of virus expansion? Well, sure. I mean, you're protecting, you're protecting the herd. <laughs> one yeah. Another. Yeah, um, herd protection. That's good, yeah. Yeah, so I guess the, the total... Um, I could say the percentage, the percentage of people who have a robust um, immune response, um, the percentage of, of, of people that are required to protect the herd can be different uh, depending on, upon the, the, the exact conditions. 
Mm -hmm. um, so you're right. If there is not so much contact, um, then then perhaps that that number changes. And that's what we've seen in in New Zealand. They have zero spread right now. Zero. Korea has very few new cases. Uh, South Korea, uh, Taiwan has been very efficient. China eradicated the virus in seven with the seven week. Not eradicated, but re reduced it by the 99.99% uh, with a seven-week lockdown. So it's possible. It is possible, and I think, you know, again, we need to follow guidelines. Now everyone is wearing masks here. So I've okay. never, you know, something I've never seen before, but I'm very glad yeah. that people have uh, have responded very well to those, um, to those recommendations. Um, and and that's you know that's what we need. We need to follow these uh, these these rules in order to uh, prevent the spread and to to, to keep um, you know to keep the public um, as healthy as possible. That's a perfect last word. Thank you everyone for listening. Uh, please stay tuned. There's plenty more to come. And bye. <laughs>